Yeah, you just and the and the, the the fact is you don't. We get these moments of intuition, but we've been taught, especially with people with trauma, they're taught not to pay attention to their intuition. Yeah. They're taught to be. I mean, I was taught to be afraid, to be meek, not to speak up, and I'll be really. It's not not an easy track to overcome some of those things. Ooh, I need to be. Welcome back to Mom Nation from the Heart. And now a word from our sponsor. Hey y'all, Katie here, founder of Mom Nation and owner and operator of Team Evo AZ at EXP Realty, your go-to gal for anything real estate in the state of Arizona. I am the sponsor of today's show. I will link my page and information in the show notes so you can quickly and easily get in touch with me should you need anything real estate, any advice, or maybe you're looking to get into the business. I sure hope you enjoy today's show. Thanks for listening. Hey, Mom Nation, we are back now with season six of From the Heart podcast, where we share inspirational stories, useful information, and we discuss a variety of women-related pro uh, products, I was going to say. We might discuss women-related products, but mainly it's women-related topics, topics from the heart. I was just telling Gwendolyn, uh, oh, Gwendolyn Kay, our guest today, who I'm super excited to have, I was just telling her before we hopped on that I, I just, I love the title of this podcast because it really is a great description. Really what we talk about here are matters of the heart. And, and like Gwendolyn said, she said it perfectly. She said, that's, that's really it, right? Like, that's the bottom line. Like, that's what matters. That's all that matters, right? Mm -hmm. All of it. That's, I mean, that's, that come, that's what comes, everything comes down to is the heart, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, there's this, I, I'm totally in love with the Beatles. I'm, I, I love that old classic rock, you know, rock from that era and their song, All You Need Is Love. I listen to wow. it over and over and I listen to those <laughs> lyrics and I'm like, you know, that John Lennon, he knew something back in the day. It was pretty darn spot on. Keep it simple. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So let's jump right into it, Gwendolyn. Tell us why you're here today and, and give us a little bit of background on you. I, I'm so excited to have this conversation. Um, well, let me see. I am an, I'm an NLP master practitioner. Cool. I'm a hypnotherapist and I'm a laughter yoga leader. So I have a lot of tools in my little tool chest that I help coach people and help bring more laughter and more light and more power to each individual. So that's kind of what I do that. Um, the reason I really get started in doing this for other people is because I came from an abusive childhood, you know, I, so many people have, right? I mean, yeah. there's just so much relate. trauma out there. Yeah, there's a lot of trauma. And it took me a long time and a lot of studies and a lot of work by myself to really heal from a lot of that and to find pieces of myself and to be able to start to give back. And so I'm able to use my hypnotherapy, um, my laughter, uh, to be able to speak to people in a different way that actually helps them be more powerful in their lives and to not have that trauma be something that holds them back anymore. So that's what I'm really passionate about. I love it. And I feel like, and maybe, you know, you can relate to this so much comes from childhood, so much of our personality, so much of the way we think, all of that. And at what point for you, did you realize this is not normal? These patterns that I'm running aren't normal and, and I need to do something about this. And how well, can we help people sort of identify that? In their yeah, own it's really interesting because there's so many patterns. So most of the things that I deal with, um, you know, somebody will come to somebody will come to me and say, "Oh, I have an issue. I'm having a problem with this," and it's never really. That's not usually the problem because that's just a symptom of the problem. Right. It's something that started a long time ago. It's not even in our conscious mind. I help people get to the subconscious reasons why they do things. Because, you know, you can know how to diet all day long, you know, eat this and do that, but we don't do it. Why do we not do it? Those are the blocks that are stuck in there. Right. And people get stuck. So as a kid, I, I was a weird kid. Um, I mean, I had a very violent childhood. So there was that as trying to escape that and trying to figure out how to make, how to deal with my life in a way that kept me alive. 
um, or kept me being able to deal with what was going on. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of um, research on hypnosis. And back then I had to read. We didn't have YouTube or Google. No Google back then. No Google. I had to go to bookstores. Imagine the library. And I, look, <laughs> and I didn't even know what to look for. I'm like, I don't know. Uh, Self-help wasn't a thing back then. So I had to really find every tool that I could find and do a lot of reading. So I knew that my life, you know, you, you watch Beaver Cleaver on TV, right? The Cleaver show and how their moms and the dads are nice. And most people don't live that. No, it's not real for most people. And even, even if it looks real, it isn't right. There's other things embedded in there. So I realize that everybody on this planet is dealing with something. You know, I think that's a, I think that's an excellent point because I was talking with uh, actually my therapist and, and she was mentioning, you know, trauma looks different mm -hmm. depending on who you are, depending on what you've gone through. So my trauma and your trauma where it has affected me and, and I have, you know, gone through X, Y, Z because of it it might yeah. look a bit different than yours. And sometimes I feel like people are a bit judgmental about that. Yeah. Oh, well, you didn't have it so rough. Well, yeah, still, I still had some effect from that. Well, and, and it doesn't matter when it comes, that was one of the biggest things I found is that people were trying to compete with me. You know, well, my father did this or my mother did this. And I'm like, I'm not here to compete I yeah, mean like, I don't want to be cool <laughs> yeah trauma competing is not cool mm. I don't want to be cool I want to be healthy and I want you to be healthy but that's true we all I mean people get judged for well your trauma is not as bad as my trauma or and it has what I love about the work that I do is it's got nothing to do with any of that it's about you specifically and what went on for you and how did that affect you and it doesn't matter what it is right I think that is the most important point because nobody else experienced exactly what you experienced, yeah. filtered it the way you did, depending on what happened. So what does it matter what everybody else thinks and feels about your situation? It doesn't. Yeah. But and then we find ourselves judging ourselves like, oh my gosh, I didn't, you know, my life was fine compared to this person's life. And I'm not, how come I can't deal with it better? Or how come I'm not doing better? Mm -hmm. And so then we spend all that time judging <laughs> we, we've got the judgment around other people. We've got the judgment around our parents. And then we have our own judgment about the fact that we're not doing good enough because we're never doing good enough, especially I'm a single parent. I'm a single mom of twins. There's just, you can't be a perfect person no. at all or a perfect parent. It just doesn't happen. Right. Right. I, I, I love the individual aspect of it. So at what point through your, your experience, because you, you came down this road on a personal level and then you realized that you're passionate about it. And so you started helping others, right? Yes. So at what I, point did you start to realize this, that, that, that healing is really an individual thing? I think I always knew it. And I always knew it from a young childhood because I, I knew that my mother acted a certain way because of the story of her childhood, because she would tell me. And I knew that my dad, he, might, he was a violent, abusive alcoholic, but I also knew what happened to him yeah. and what caused some of those things to happen for him, right? Mm -hmm. So I kind of, as a kid, I sort of, I'm like, well, psychology doesn't make sense to me when I start reading about psychology, specific parts of it, where I have to label somebody and put them in a box, because it didn't it didn't seem right to me. It seemed like everybody had their own individual objective subject. It's completely subjective, right? Yeah. Like my dad might've been violent when maybe his brother went the opposite way and just became an alcoholic and didn't, didn't engage in society at all. Mm -hmm. You know, so everybody takes their own thing. And I realized that everybody speaks their own language. Everybody takes it in a different way. And if I go talk to you as if I know what you're doing and who you are and how to fix you, that does you no good because I'm not actually getting who you really are. Or your and real so that's feelings. Why I love. Yeah. And, and they're yours. I have to find out what they are from you. So that's why I love NLP. It's NLP is neuro linguistic programming. And it's as if like, if we're a computer, we all, we're all computers, but we all have different software and you've got to understand what the software is before you can start tinkering. 
<laughs> so I have to figure out who you are and what your map of your world is to be able to help you figure out a different way to map that world. I totally agree. And I would love to get into the NLP conversation because that just fascinates me. Um, but what awesome. can we, what can we share, um, with our audience to sort of help them to identify because maybe, you know, they are one that has sort of, uh, put their trauma in a box labeled with it's not so bad. Why can't I keep relationships? Why mm -hmm. do I keep, you know, running these same processes, definition of insanity, right? Keep running the same thing, yeah. expecting the different result. I'm not getting the different result. How can we help people sort of identify, hey, you know, maybe it's important that I go talk with somebody like Gwendolyn or do something that has yeah. more to do with me than the outside world. Something different. And something different because the problem is, is we are in our heads all the time, right? Like we're completely with ourselves all the time. And how do you do something different if you've never done something different? Yeah. How do you right? know? Yeah. You just, and, the, and the, the, the fact is you don't. We get these moments of intuition, but we've been taught, especially with people with trauma, they're taught not to pay attention to their intuition. Yeah. They're taught to be, I mean, I was taught to be afraid, to be meek, not to speak up. And I'll be really, it's not, not an easy track to overcome some of those things. It's very uncomfortable. And sometimes when you're the most uncomfortable is where you're growing the most. Mm. Mm. It's when we're comfortable, you know, yes, my father was an abusive alcoholic, but I knew what to do. I knew he would do this and he would do this. And he would do this. I knew what the pattern was the pattern. to not be in that pattern is very uncomfortable because I don't know. I've not had any experience with not having that pattern. So it's a very uncomfortable, you have to get used to being uncomfortable and searching out different things. Now there's, there's books, there's YouTube videos, there's defining it. Like, I mean, it just took me a little while ago to realize that my ex-husband was a narcissist. Mm. Now I knew he was, you know, he had some bipolar issues, but I didn't understand how that intermingled with being a narcissist. And I'm, I do this work all the time. Yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh, he's a narcissist. I, oh, I get it now. But that's by watching videos and listening to the definitions. And then to be honest, I think there's some of those things that we are so blocked that we can't get out of our own way. It, okay, you can do it yourself with books and videos and YouTube and everything. It's just going to take a little bit longer because you're with you and dealing with you. When you have an outside, an outside voice, who knows how to guide you through that kind of stuff, That's who important. can be a different voice for you and be your voice of sanity. Like how many, how often have you talked to your girlfriend and they're like, she's like, Oh yeah, that's crazy. That's not working. Yeah. And you're like, I know, <laughs> Yeah, but you spent your whole time judging yourself for it. Right. 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 And that's something that I feel is again, maybe societal or whatever, but people don't share. Why mm -hmm. are people so quiet in my forties? So I'm 42 and a half. Um, and when I hit the 40 bridge, for some reason, it was like a light switch flipped and mm -hmm. I started talking about me and I started talking yeah. about my feelings and my inner workings and what I went through as a child and how I felt as a child and how that spilled into young adulthood, adulthood, mm. you know, I mean, you have a hundred destroyed relationships that you know that you destroyed and you got to start like somewhere. Um, <laughs> why, do, why do we feel that we cannot share? It, there's just mm. a, a weird shame there. Well, and that's, that's, you said it really clearly that, well, there's two reasons. And one of them, you're not going to like, it's age. Yeah. Some of it is age and you, you know, you, a kid, a, a kid doesn't learn how to walk just by walking, right? A kid has to get up. You'll see them pull themselves up and they'll fall down. They'll figure out where they're wobbly. And that's kind of like human nature. We're going to go through a pattern. We just are. Some of us are going to have extra help or extra support because we have good parents. Some of us are not. Some of most us. Of us. <laughs> yeah. And some of you have good parents, but they left you with certain things that don't work. Yeah. Just because they were dealing with their own issues. Now, so some of that is age. Like I'm 51. I don't care. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you everything. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you whatever. I'm not going to tell you everything. I'm going to tell you what's, what's apt, but I don't have anything to hide because I've been not hiding it for so long and working on it and telling people my story so that they can get something for themselves out of it. 
Mm-hmm. Now, the other thing is that it is shame. Shame is so prevalent in our, in our culture and in, in all cultures on so many levels about so many things and an abusing traumatic experience. Nobody wants to look bad. My yeah. dad didn't want to look bad. Right. Everybody in town knew he, he beat his wife and threatened his children. Hmm. Everybody in town knew this, but we didn't talk about it. We pretended he was a great guy because he wanted to be a great guy in front of other people. Mm-hmm. And nobody's going to to buck that story because then you're going to have to, what, what are you going to do about it? Right. 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 I can't do anything about it. Right. So there's the shame. And then, then there's the, I'm not good enough. Like if my father, if I was not good enough for my own father to love and care about me and take care of me, then how on earth can I be good enough for somebody else? Anywhere. When your own parents don't do that for you, then there must be something wrong with me. And the truth is there really isn't. And so do you feel like, because this is kind of how I felt like it was for me, I kind of created that chaotic relationship throughout my adulthood. Well, you draw, you only draw what you know. Like how on earth are you going to get a loving, cherishing relationship when you've never even seen it? Never had it, never saw it happen. Yeah. And the only thing you've had, so I think what we do is like, um, I know I did it. I found a man who treated me really nicely, but had, it's like your trauma meets somebody else's trauma. Right. It's trauma meets trauma. That's all it is. And it's not that you're bad. It's not that you've got a bad picker. (laughs) It's that you don't know. You haven't adjusted any of your dials enough to to get what you say that you want. And to be honest, how would you know when you found it? Right. Because there's people who will love bomb you. And that looks like love. And yet that also comes with some other tags attached to it. There's other things attached to it. Other expectations. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. there's anger behind it or there's controlling behind it or so there's all of these things that we have to like it's like a game it's like a game of chess yeah and to to be honest the only thing that you can really be sure about I love the saying when they say a bird doesn't um a bird doesn't have to trust the branch because the bird trusts itself Hmm. and when a bird lands on a branch you notice that they sit and they just hover but they know that if that branch starts to fall they can fly away and most people don't know that they can fly away most people don't have that strength or that um acceptance in themselves and that's where the work that i do is so i think is so important because i don't heal people i just help people find their own strength within whatever they've had to deal with that they've ultimately been trained away from Mm-hmm. because your intuition, right? Right. Because yeah. I believe, you know, I, I have a seven-year-old and watching him grow has been amazing, but I believe that we're not born with that. That's trained. We learn that. Yeah. Well, and, and what's interesting is as a parent, you give whatever, whatever you've got going on or fears or whatever that is, your kids pick it up. Yeah. And it's not, and it's not intentional and, and we do our best. And we don't really know what best is because to be honest, for one kid, it's different than another kid, right? So as a parent, I always like to say, you're going to mess up no matter what you do. Don't worry about it. Yeah, right. <laughs> you're going to help your child. You're, gonna, you're a loving parent. You, that's what you want to be. Um, but we all have stuff that we come out of this world with. And at a certain point in our adulthood, we have to deal with that. So I'm my kids have had to grow up with me and bless them they are amazing people who people go to for for advice and I'm I'm blessed to say that but I can't say that that was easy Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they're still unlearning some of the things that I had fears of when I was younger you know Mm -hmm. money fears and being able to as a single mom just being able to take care of them and that's the world we live in you know when you're looking for lions there's always lions (laughs) Right. Right. There's always bills to be paid. If you get sick, your children get sick. I mean, there's so many things for us to concentrate on. And to be honest, we are so hard on ourselves and there's not a whole lot of support systems, right? There really aren't. No, there really aren't. Not for this kind of stuff. I mean, you can, you know, get assistance financially if you need that or housing or whatever, if you need that. Right. But where it really counts, I don't, 
I don't see a lot of resources for that. Or what am I trying to say? You don't know what you don't know. Yeah. So where does the person that doesn't know, but they're running the patterns and things are not working in their life, but they don't understand why, like, where do they flip that yeah. switch, <laughs> you know? And where do they find it, right? It's like, yeah, people, I've had people come to me who have tried everything. They've tried everything and nothing was working because they were trying harder mm-hmm. and you're trying harder with the same tools. You need right. new tools. You need somebody who's got better tools than you do. And that's not always easy to find. Totally get it. I mean, I don't, I don't trust everybody to work with my children or with myself just because I'm very well trained in what I do. I know what the language of the mind does. I'm, you know, a lot of brain science behind that. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not a Debbie Downer, but I'm not also, I'm not into toxic positivity, right? Life is hard. It's not easy. And how do we deal with those things? So getting help is really important, but how do you do that? And that's, you know, there's people constantly putting together, like, I mean, like what you guys are doing. It's a beautiful support system for parents and for, you know, I mean, I didn't really know about you. And my friend is like, listen. You've got to be, I'm going to add you to this group. You really need to be in there. Oh, awesome. <laughs> like, awesome. So it's okay. It's important but, to share with each other when we stumble yeah. upon something great. Yeah. To share it and to share it with each other and to let each other know that we're not perfect. We're all struggling. And, you know, we need you, professional help is, is a really good thing when you can get it. Yeah. And, we don't have enough that that's free or out there. Um, in fact, I just emailed somebody the other day who's like, I'm trying to put this thing together, you know, to help teens and who with depression. And I was like, okay, so, but those are hard to put together. You know, you need money to pay, to, to take care of people. And that being said, there's still a lot of really good, amazing resources out there. And a lot of good people out there. For sure. But again, with the shame, yeah. Why? And I think it's getting better or maybe I'm just getting older, but, um, why as a society, do we shy away from, or, or many of us shy away from mm. professional help? Like why is therapist such a bad word? Yeah. What's fascinating about that is that we think we, we think we have to do everything ourselves. So we have to be strong and, Showing struggle is showing weakness and showing weakness means um, death, <laughs> right? right? Like if you show, if you're out in the desert and again, we're not, we don't, we don't live with lions, but it's like we do. Like that one thing can set you off and you literally feel like you're dying inside. And the problem is, is that the mental illness doesn't show up like physical. Like if you were cut your arm and you're bleeding out, you're going to get to a hospital. Somebody's going to help you and sew that up, right? Right. It's obvious. Yeah. It, you can't hide that as easily as you can hide the mental illness. And I'm okay. I'm fine. And it's not taken this seriously. And to be honest, there's a lot of drugs around that kind of stuff, like medications and stuff like that, which I've had some issues with, um, with both my ex and with, my, with one of my kids. And so I have some, some concerns about some of that also Mm -hmm. so it's easier to hide your mental stuff it's easier to think oh no I've got this because if we've got this plus if we get help we might have to change that's true and it's super uncomfortable it's horribly uncomfortable even to to change for the better I I don't yes I mean I get it but I don't you know (laughs) Well, when we know, we know what the game is like, right. As soon as you go into your family, family events, right. Your mom plays a role, your brother or sister plays a role. Everybody has their role to play and everybody knows what that is. Mm -hmm. So as soon as like one person gets help or starts not playing the same game, they all attack. Yeah. Right. Because it's all like, well, you're not behaving or you're setting a boundary. How dare you? Yeah. After all these years. Because now you're finally going like, I can't take it anymore. (laughs) But as soon as you start doing that, that's what shows up. But you start seeing the patterns and it takes support to do that because it's hard to be strong when you've, when you've been beaten down. Right. Right. And I feel like 
it's hard to set boundaries with the people who raised you. So can we talk about that a little bit? Can you give some examples to those out there that may be struggling with um, this pattern in terms of a relationship with their family, like we just discussed? Um, What, what is a boundary, first of all, and (laughs) why is it important? Because I think a good lot of us don't have them. Well, we're not supposed to in families, right? Like for some of us, we're not supposed to have boundaries. Like I was never supposed to have any boundary of any sort in my family. I was supposed to do what I was told to do and take whatever I was taking. And it wasn't about me. It was about everybody else. Mm -hmm. So here's the problem. It needs to be about you. Right. Like if you're unhappy, if you spend time with a person and you find that when you leave that person, you're miserable, you feel depressed or you feel upset or you feel like you start judging everything you do, there's something not working with that person that you just met. Right. That could be your mom, your sister, your father, your brother, could be a friend. And you have to look at that. Like, how do I feel when I talk to this person? How do they speak to me? Well, that you can do on your own, right? But noticing that you're miserable is the first thing. And you don't, you don't have to be miserable. Like you're not supposed to be miserable in life. Right. Now, your family expects you to be that way. So how do you change that? Oh, well, that's a can of worms. And that yeah. first of all, you have to decide how do you want to feel? Like, I would like to have a conversation with my mother that doesn't make me feel like I'm not being heard mm. or I'm not being judged, but yes. that's not how that, but here's the problem. My mother is who she is. I can't do a dang thing about other people. I really can't. But I can do the only thing I have any control of in any part of my life is me, Mm -hmm. my feelings, my emotions and my boundaries. I literally did not speak to my family for about four years. At one time, we'd had a big fight. I was over it. I was done. I couldn't take it anymore. And I didn't talk to them for four years. And then what happened is they, I had my children and they're like, hello, (laughs) attentively. Mm. And I started talking to them, but I decided that I had a boundary, what I was and was not going to do, what kind of conversations I would and would not have. And you might have to do those. I, I was drastic. I had to leave for four years, not to talk to my family, to be okay, to find who I was outside of that pattern. So you didn't have that influence. So you could work on you. I I had to, it it was not going to happen any other way for me. Now, if you're in the situation, the first thing you have to realize is that person is not going to be different. They're not going to change. They're not going to be who they're, they're never going to give you the love, approval, kindness, the words that you're looking for. You know this because they do it every time. Mm -hmm. Every year they say the same things, right? Every behavior. If they never talk to you on your birthday, they're never going to talk to you on your birthday, even though you want that. Mm -hmm. They're never going to be, who are they? If you look outside of your system and your family system and who they are as a person to to you as a person and start mapping out like how the behaviors look, that's kind of normal, right? Yeah. Now, when I go see my mother now, I have a boundary where I spend only a certain amount of time with her because she's very negative. There's only certain things I will talk to her about. I don't bring up other subjects or subjects, especially the ones that I want her to love and care about me. She's not going to do that. And I have to love and care about myself enough to not bring it up because she will never give me those loving, tender moments that I was looking for. So you have to just get to a point where you've got to know yourself a little bit better and you've got to know that person a little bit better, not as your mom or your dad or your brother or your sister, but that person and their behaviors. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, would you be friends with them? Would you establish a yeah. relationship with them if you weren't related? And is it worth it? For me, going to see family for a family event once a year, I have to put my armor on. I have to go, okay, here's what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen because it's going to be something because they know how to push your buttons. That's oh, what they're yeah. in the, they're in the business of pushing your buttons. What are your buttons? You've got to know what your own buttons are. 
And once you know what your buttons are, you've got to unhook them for yourself. And that's just a thought that could be writing, that could be, you know, it's not real. Is it true? Half the time, it's not true. Mm -hmm. The stuff they say and do isn't true. And it's all about them. They're trying to cause you to be somebody because of their own trauma. Because they can't be that support system for themselves. They're looking to you and really relying and expecting you to show up as that support system. Whatever it is they them. want. Because right. there's some people who want you to argue with them. Yes, they that's true. That. Or Because for them, love equals arguing or passion or so whatever they want to call it. Mm -hmm. But if it doesn't equal that for you, then you have to unhook it for yourself. But you have to really look clearly at those relationships. Because if, if you weren't like, if this wasn't my mom, if this was just some lady treating me this way, would I do that? No. Why would I? Just right. because I was born to her, I don't owe her anything. Right. But she doesn't owe me anything either. True. Anymore. True. Those are the best words that I've heard all day. Like those are, <laughs> they, they ring so true. Just because you came from somebody, it is not their job to do you. It is not their job to support you, love you. It's not. And a lot of people nope. think that it is, but it's really not. And then vice versa. It's not yeah. my job to serve you. It's not my job to do the things that you want me to do to make you happy. That's on yeah. you. And that's with my kids. My kid, it's not my job to tell them what they're doing in life or what they're doing right or wrong. I don't know what's right or wrong for them. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't see their book of destiny. I'm not God. I can't, I don't know what's out there for them. I don't know. But I do know I can give them all the tools that I can have and they can choose to use them or choose not to use them. So you get to, you can let people choose to be with you under certain, certain circumstances. Like I will be with you, but I don't want to talk any medical issues. Like mm -hmm. that makes me sick. It makes me want to pass out. If we start talking about medical issues, you've got to be ready to walk away. Mm -hmm. It's like buying a car. Yep. You, you got to be ready to it. walk away. Like yep. these are my, these are the things I cannot tolerate anymore. And you have to be ready to, to walk away from it and say, I'm not doing that. And it's uncomfortable. And everybody gets mad or doesn't or gets weird or doesn't. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they don't get mad at all and they don't really care. And that hurts. Mm -hmm. I've seen that with people where they've put their boundaries and the people are like, fine, I don't need to see you anymore. And that hurts. But to be honest, it explains more about them than about you because you've got to want more for yourself. Exactly. You have to you know, want more and you deserve it. Totally, totally. Because really you're in charge of you. And if everybody did that, so, so tell me what you think about this. So here's what I love. Said family member, whomever, do this for me. You need to love me this way. You need to do all this, all this, all this for me. Mm -hmm. But you can't do that for you because that's selfish if you do. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, what the hell is the person that just gave you the whole list of things? That they're not selfish then. Right. But they can be selfish, but you can't. Right. Which is interesting. Right. I mean, if you really looked at it, like if it was on a piece of paper and two people talking in a, or writing in a book, you'd be like, what the? What the heck? Not, that doesn't make sense. But in families, we just accept it because we were told. We were brought up as kids to be who you're supposed to be, right? Or not, or you went against the grain and tried not to be any of that. You're fighting something, right? You're like you're always like fighting for something. Mm -hmm. So you have to redefine how you want your relationships. Like what would be your perfect relationship with a parent figure or even a friendship and start building that as a structure for how you're going to start treating yourself. Yeah. And they're not going to change. They're not going to apologize. The other person is never going to be except who they are. And the thing is, their behavior has nothing to do with you. It's all about them and their trauma. Everything to do with them. Everything to do. You know, my therapist once said, um, look at people like, like five-year-old Gwendolyn. Yeah. Like you're, you're literally talking to when they're in that mode. You're literally talking to their five, six, seven, four-year-old version. Yeah. And you can't argue with that. Have you ever tried to argue with a five-year-old? Yes. But, but, but <laughs> we lose. But. <laughs> <laughs> There's no logic because it's not about logic. It's about emotions. 
And that's all people are as bundles and bundles of emotions, you know, in your, in your family life, in your work, in your day to day, you know, when somebody gets mad or gets upset, it's because they're emotionally tied to something, something's important to them and they're upset about something. Now, whether that has to affect you, it has nothing to do with you, number one. Number two, it has everything to do with them. And number three, it, you have to choose if you take it or not. And the problem with people with trauma is we've been taught to take a lot of stuff that's not ours. Right. Like most of it's not ours. Almost all of it's not ours. Right. And when you stop not taking that stuff, life changes. It's not easy. It's very <laughs> uncomfortable. You know, when you're not, you don't get into contradictions with people. When you don't, you know, don't talk back to your parents. Be seen right. and not heard. Right? Okay. Well, that's not how I want my children to have to be. So, yeah. So you have to decide for yourself how you want to rearrange your life. And it's like rewriting your life. It's rewriting who you want to be. It's rewriting your character. And it's not an easy task. And it takes time. And it takes practice. And it takes failing a bit. Yeah. Yeah. And being okay with that. that. Yeah. And you know, something that you said a little while back that I thought was just so brilliant and not enough of us do really pay attention to your feelings. They're truly your guidance system. And they're always going to tell you the truth. And I love what you said about when you're with somebody and then you leave them and you don't feel better in the having of that relate or or the, the having of that experience with them. You got to yeah. look deeper into that. And well, not what's brush really it under the rug? Yeah, well, and it's fascinating because it might not be anything wrong. It was so funny when I really got this for myself because I I would hang out with this one guy. We'd see each other out because um, I I like go singing and stuff. And every time I would sit down and have a conversation with him, and it wasn't anything in particular. He didn't say anything. I just felt horrible afterwards, and it was just like why am I spending time with this person when every time, and it was nothing he did, nothing specific. And it wasn't really specific, but I was like, why I could be spending that same two, three hours talking to somebody who, who I feel better. Yeah. That I feel happy. Like, why do I have to pay a cost? Like, why do I have to be, why, why is that okay? And it wasn't that he did anything wrong or he said anything wrong. It just, felt yucky for whatever reason. And I had to trust my gut. And I said, I'm going to stop talking to him. Mm -hmm. I'm going to just complete not, not being mean. I didn't have to do anything. I just didn't spend time with him. And, and it was just a matter of being kinder to myself and finding people who, because there's plenty of people in the world, honey, if there's somebody that makes you feel yucky, there's like 20 people out there that'll make you feel better about yourself. Mm -hmm if we allow it. But for some reason, you know, martyrs, right? Like, we're not good enough. We have to put up with a bad person, the person that makes us feel crappy or insults us or thinks they're prettier than we are. And like, lets us know that, (laughs) you know, all of these toxic behaviors, which, again, say more about them than us. Mm -hmm. But I have to choose where I want to spend my energy. And I'd rather spend my energy with people who are up like this conversation is so uplifting and makes me feel good and makes me inspires me to go out and be a better person. Like those are the conversations I want more of. Why would I spend time with somebody who makes me feel crappy? Why do we feel like we have to pay a cost? I love what you just said. Yeah. Because I'm not good enough. Because I'm not good enough. Like, I'm, I was a quiet child. I didn't know how to speak very well. I'm really good at speaking now, but <laughs> I, horrible. I would hide in a corner. I was terrified of talking to people. Everything I said, I judged because everything in my childhood had it be that I was a horrible person in every shape, form, and manner, <sighs> that there was no good parts to me. And so, of course, I'm going to find people who make me feel crappy because they can. Like there are plenty of takers out there, plenty of takers and users because it's just the nature of it. So I have to decide that that's not who I want to hang out with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have to decide that, you know, I'd rather be alone than feel badly about myself because I don't need to. There's nothing wrong with me. Right. Right. There never really was. I totally agree with you. I, I don't feel that a good relationship has struggled. Like, you know, maybe there's little things here and there, right? When you're married, yeah, things happen. But 
Yeah. A friendship's a new. Well, and here's the thing. Sometimes we need time out from each other too. So sometimes we're growing at different paces, right? Like sometimes like my, my friends who didn't have children maybe wandered off and I, some of them I'm still friends with, some of them I'm not because I had kids and they couldn't, they didn't want, it just wasn't in their sphere to deal with that, but right. they were good friends before. They're still good friends now, but they're just not in my sphere anymore because it's not what I'm doing. It's not what I'm up to. Like if I'm going to go, like, say I want to, um, I'm going to do track racing, right? I'm probably going to be meet more people in the track racing field and coaching, right? So whatever I'm doing, I might meet more people and the people who don't are into that or whatever may or may not stick around and that doesn't make it bad or good it just means I'm up to something different and there's different people in that sphere for me to get to know I love that I love that so much because there are some ideas out there that some people have that like say you develop a friendship I don't know five six years ago whatever And you go through life and there's growth happening and there's change and everything. And you drift away from that friendship because either it doesn't make you feel good anymore or whatever. And then you become the bad guy in some cases because you veered from that friendship. Well, well, I'm sorry, but things are constantly changing. How can they ever stay the same? Well, and there are friendships that don't want to change. Mm. It's not what I'm up to. Uh And I have to, because for me, it was so hard because when I had a friend, I wanted to keep them forever. Yeah. And that's not how life works. I'm I'm up to a lot of stuff. I'm very busy. I have a lot of things going on in different worlds and I'm creating, you know, all I'm creating my business and I've got like a million things. That's not everybody can keep pace with that. And it's so interesting. It's like, it's like relationships. We see, we see that all of these relationships, well, I've, I've been a failure in all these relationships. No, you really haven't. You've had relationships and they serve their time and purpose. And now you're getting into new ones or you're get, you're moving away from them. And instead of blessing that and blessing the friends and people that come into your life, we judge it. We judge ourselves as, oh, I'm not a good friend. I'm a horrible person. I can't keep friends more, more than like five years or 20 years or mm-hmm. whatever it is. Whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. And instead of seeing the blessing of having those people come into our lives and maybe they need to go out of our lives, but blessing that instead of judging that mm-hmm. and making that be something that we didn't do right or we failed at or something like that. We're just growing differently. And if they're meant to come back, they'll come back. Mm-hmm. it shouldn't be that big of a deal. It took me a lot of years to really be okay with that mm-hmm. and to be okay with that. People are constantly coming into my life and out of my life. And I love that now. I do but too. I still have to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. I love that. Um, so much here. There's so much. We're, we're going to have to have you back on <laughs> just saying <laughs> any day, anytime, anywhere. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> because this conversation is amazing and it's so well-placed for me personally, which The universe has a way of doing that, um, which is pretty awesome. But let's talk a little bit about some of the ways that you're helping your clients deal with this. You mentioned happy yoga or laughy yoga. Laughter. Yeah, laughter yoga. I want to hear all about that. So that it's really awesome. What's really cool about laughter, and I was a very serious child, very, very serious, very serious, very serious person. So for me, and I'm still a little bit serious, but I, I, I have a fun side. What's awesome about laughter, laughter yoga is laughter for no reason at all, combined with yoga type breathing. So you're not doing yoga and laughing. Um, there's just exercises where I lead a group of people, hundreds of people sometimes, six sometimes, and I, I lead them in laughter, like just fake laughter, because your body doesn't know the difference between fake laughter and real laughter. Mm. So if you fake laugh, you get all the benefits, like you get your um, body's oxygenated, your veins literally open up, um, get new air into your system, you feel better, you have less pain. It's amazing what laughter can do, right? So we just fake laugh. That's all I do. Which probably makes you really laugh because that's funny, <laughs> right? Like that's hilarious. Well, and I, I will chat. Okay. I have been in some corporate events and I love it because there is always somebody in the front. It's always like this guy and he's, he's not, not going to laugh. 
And then he comes up to me after the show and says, that was really good. Um, it was really great. I think you did a great thing. He goes, but you need more PowerPoint. <laughs> Now, I didn't have any PowerPoint at all, and I was just laughing. But that told me two things. First of all, just because he's not outwardly laughing doesn't mean he's not getting some benefit. Right. And it's fascinating how people, I mean, I'm, I will just sit in front of a crowd and just laugh. Just laugh. And one of the things is, okay, so like one of the things is a one, you can do this. You can uplift and oxygenate your system in less than five minutes, like less than two minutes, right? somebody's coming in so um and i'm going to show you one one of the laughter techniques i use it's called the one meter laugh okay. and i go like this i go a a <laughs> and i and i just continue to laugh now i could do that on the other side also and i'll do that i'll just go a a <laughs> Now I look like I'm crazy and I'm insane, but I feel energized. I feel oxygenated. I feel happier. My blood is pumping more. You can literally change your physiology and your body in less than five minutes. I love it. And I feel like, and tell me what you think about this, but I feel like being in a room where you're doing that and maybe you have grumpy guy, um, mm -hmm. do, do you have to go? We can, we can wrap this conversation. We're going to have that. So yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I've got about uh, four more minutes. Okay, right on. So, so you have grumpy guy, right? But I feel like the energy in the room, the vibration has been raised in the room. He's getting that benefit. He absolutely is. I mean, the fact that he had to come up and tell me that I needed more PowerPoint, but he liked it. He wasn't going to laugh, but he really liked it. And I just thought that was fascinating because it's a strange thing to do. Most people are super uncomfortable. You've got that shame and that fear and all of that stuff coming up. But if I'm standing in front of a crowd laughing hysterically, it's hard not to laugh. And it's hard not to get the benefit. And it's such a simple, simple thing. And it literally takes people, I, I do a scale of one to 10. When they walk in the door, they rate all these things. You know, how do you feel? Um, how's your mood? And they will go from a three, four to a six, seven, eight, nine. Just from and that. That's, and just, and I do, I'll do like a half hour. Wow. Wow. It's just, it's unbelievable. And it's a simple, simple technique that we don't use because it's a little silly. <laughs> And we're, you know, we can't be judged. Cannot be judged and can't be silly because we have to be adults and we have to be very serious and get stuff done, yeah. which I very much do. I'm a very efficient person. And I think if we bring more laughter into spaces where there isn't enough laughter, I think it makes a huge difference. And I've noticed that for myself in the work that I do with people. Mm -hmm. So that's just, uh, that's my like a little tip for the day. Go laugh a little bit. Go or, laugh a lot of it. <laughs> well, and I do have a YouTube video where I did, um, I need to put more videos up on laughter yoga, but I've done a 21 day laughter challenge. And I went through Arizona and different places and would do laughter yoga out in different spots in Arizona and videotaped it. I, but 21 days, I, had, to, I had to do it live because I was terrified. Um, to do with it out in public where nobody knows what I was doing. But, um, and that's on my YouTube channel, which is um, G K A Y space do it anyway, because I tend to, I tend to be afraid of things and I just go and do it anyway. <laughs> oh, I love that. So is that the best way if our audience members want to connect with you? First of all, do they, we're both in Arizona for those of you who yeah. don't know, um, do they have to be Arizona based to work with you? Nope. Cool. Actually, I connect. I literally can hypnotize people over over Zoom. I know that's very strange, but uh, I do a lot of coaching through all over the world. So, <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So, what's the best way for our audience members to connect with you if they're interested in learning more about what you do or getting some yeah. silly laughter going on? So, um, there's the the YouTube video is uh, the YouTube channel is GKAY space Do It Anyway all together. D O I T N whatever. Anyway, and then um, you can reach me at G K A Y fifty five at gmail .com. And if you have any questions, I also have a website. I'm still working on it, so I'm not sure what it looks like today. But it's also called G G K. It's just G K and then space. Do it anyway. So 
Um, awesome. Those are the ways. And I don't know if you have a way for me to link my stuff down below. I can go ahead and link that all below if that yeah, helps. Yeah, absolutely. Some on Instagram, TikTok, you name it. Yeah. If you want to shoot it to me, <laughs> once we're done, just shoot it to me. Then I'll add those show notes. Usually I do. And I was going to put your Facebook page, but if you want to send all the other stuff, I am happy to put that out there in the, in the show notes for you so that it can be easy for our audience members to just click yeah. and go and connect with Gwendolyn. So much thank, easier that way. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. What a, what a conversation this has been. And like, I have goosebumps everywhere. I have to have you back. We have to talk more about NLP. We have to talk more about trauma and how to sort of recognize that because I feel like there's a lot of people out there with unrecognized trauma. And that's really, yeah. it's my life's work. Um, I've discovered after hitting the 40 bridge, right? It's my life's absolutely. work to, to help people to, to do this and to heal and to um, really realize the, their own power. I think it's just so, so important. So that's all awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And if you <laughs> out there are interested in being a guest on the show, like Gwendolyn, please follow us at mom nation on Facebook. Our handle is at mom nation USA. Give us a like and a follow, shoot us a message while you're at it. And perhaps while you're listening right now, do us a favor, subscribe to our podcast channel, download these episodes, because that gives us a little bit more I don't know, juice to get out there, right? So that we can get this info out to the, exactly <laughs> out to the masses. And please, please share with your friends. We really want this awesome information getting out to as many ears yeah. that can hear it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thanks. You too. <laughs> Bye, Gwendolyn. See you later. <laughs>